Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to be with you once again as we are continuing this series about loving the Lord. And here we are today, we've covered loving the Lord with all your, your strength, your soul, your mind, your heart. And, and, and that's all combined, it's intrinsic. You can't separate one from the others. So this action of loving God, what, what, We're going to talk about loving his church. Now, before I go any further, I want to introduce myself. My name is Dustin Pruitt, for those of you that don't know. I'm one of the leaders here at Restore Community Church, and it is my pleasure to be continuing with this series. This is a series that is near and dear to my heart. I I quite have enjoyed diving deep on this. And uh, I don't know if any pastor is allowed to say that they didn't enjoy diving deeper into the Bible and knowing God. So... Uh, don't take what I said with a grain of salt. Just, no, I really did. I really enjoyed diving in this. So today, today, we are talking about loving His church. Now, when, when I say the word church, what do you imagine? What, what is the imagery that comes into your head? Your imagination takes over and, and it shows you something. Is it like your classical uh, 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 church of England church. They, they all kind of had the same architecture, at least if they were built within the same like century. Or do you imagine Notre Dame in Paris? Do you, what do you imagine when I say the word church? Now I know when Jesus said the word church, I, I can tell you what he imagined. When Jesus said the word church, he's imagining a people. The Bible says that he, he's talked about it being the body of Christ. He's talked about it being his bride. He's not talking about four walls and a, and a slanted roof. He's not talking about stained glass windows and a list of people's names on the wall, even a beautiful vision statement here. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about church. So from the very get-go, when we're talking about loving the church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about how we need to be coming in here and scrubbing floors and cleaning the toilets, making the windows are clean, making sure it's presentable to people. I'm not talking about loving the church like that. That's a building. We can love the church by taking care of the building that's not it. So, so let's, let's kind of get into this a little bit more. That it's not this physical structure. It's, it's not this, the, this institution. It's not this hierarchy where we have Ian as the senior leader with the eldership, with the trustees, with Joe as our operations manager, as uh, Jew as a location leader, then Debbie. Like, it, it's not that. What we often imagine, it's, it's this... Thing, the New Testament is uh, equated it to a living organism, a spiritual body composed of each and every one of us. And the, the church, this, this, this body of people is the dwelling place of God. That's such like, that's something you can read in the Bible and kind of like, man, that, that's warm and fuzzy and you just keep moving on, but... The dwelling place of God is with people, is with us, His church here in the world. It's it's a place where His Word is shared between one another, where, where His love is experienced, where fellowship can be had, where believers come together for encouragement where burdens could be shared, where prayers can be given and asked for, and to grow together with one another ever more towards Christ. That's the perfect idea of the church. It's that. But it's challenged each and every day. It was challenged just as in Jesus' day. It was was challenging then. It's challenged today. So given this this understanding of what the church is, 
The question is, the question I'm going to be posing today is, how do we, as followers of Christ, respond or love the church? What is our attitude towards the assembly? What is our attitude towards one another? When, let me tell you guys, people are difficult. Have you talked to so-and-so? He cannot just shut up. I'm like, my man, I'm, I can't get a word in, word in edgewise. You're just talking the whole time. Have you heard the, some of the things she says that she thinks God says? Guys, that's so like, we, we, she, she can't be, it's hard to love people. And let's not even look in the mirror. My goodness, out the, some of the aspects of ourself that are hard to love, a little crunchy, a little, little uh, thorny, hard for people to, to come and want to love. So how do we love the church? What is our attitude towards the church? And do we see it? Do we see this assembly? Do we see this fellowship, this body as an optional thing? Of like, yeah, Jesus, that's really cool. If people want to do that, that's good for them. Do we see it like that? Or do we see it as something integral? It can't be separated, just like those aspects of love. It cannot be separated. And I feel like this is one of those sayings that I hear all the time. And I'm like, man, I don't know about that. It's in today's day and time. It was, it was different back then. It's different today. And I'm sure it was the same way back then where individualism mattered. You had to take care of your own. This is me and my house. This is my castle, my family, who I'm going to look out for. This is my image I'm going to present. This is my pride I'm going to protect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this society, this, this broken human culture that is built on individualism, it's often elevated above community where, where personal preference takes priority over everything else. It's, it's where the, the few outweigh the many in, in, our, in our personal thinking. So it's easy for our love for the church to grow cold or to even become conditional. Yeah, I'm going to go to church if, if so-and-so is not going to be there. Yeah, I'm going to go to church if this person's preaching. Yeah, I'm going to go to church if we're going to be playing these songs this way, in this key. As long as they're not going to repeat it too much. And as long as we start laying conditions on loving the church and coming together as a church. And once again, I am not talking about these four walls. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the assembly of the body, the church. Because it is the place where God dwells. And, and, and I'll get into that a little deeper in some of my future points as, we, as we're gearing up there. That we, we become tempted with this conditionality that to view church through, through the lens of consumerism, of what can the church do for me? You know, what's, what's Pastor Ian been talking about recently that, that hits me? Because that's what I need to be. They, they need to talk about the things I'm struggling with. I didn't feel very much this past Sunday, so I don't, I don't know if I'm going to go back next Sunday. I'll wait a little bit. You know, I'll wait for the next series. This, the series we're covering right now, it's not really for me. Maybe, maybe you've not heard thought these thoughts, you're all blameless lambs listening, you've not thought these thoughts, maybe you've heard someone say these thoughts, share these thoughts, when it shouldn't be what can the church for me, what, it shouldn't be what can the church do for me, but what can I do to serve and love the church, the dwelling place of God, I keep saying that because it's so important, is the place where God dwells, what can I do to love the place where God is at. Sometimes when it comes to a time of worship, it's easy. We can lift our hands, lift our voice, lift our heart and worship to God because God, you're on the throne. You are worthy of it all. We're we're like, God, you're up there and I can praise you up there so easily. But when you're in the midst of us, 
it's hard to take care of this place. Maybe I'm the only one, and I'm just I'm preaching to myself here, but I sometimes feel like this is where we can be at because the church, like I said, is full of people, and we we all have our flaws. This we we sometimes bring our brokenness in, and so loving the church isn't just about its benefits. What can it do for me? It's about loving the dwelling place of God and loving the dwelling place like Jesus loves the dwelling place. So loving the church the way Jesus loves the church. And the We've got to see this thing, not through the eye of consumerism, the lens of consumerism, but the lens of Christ. How did He love? It, 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 the church is a reflection. It's supposed to be backwards and forwards. God to us and us to God. That you can't separate the two. It can't. It doesn't work without loving as the body, as the church. We can't claim to love God while despising His people. It doesn't really make sense if you're like, man, I love my dad, but his kids suck. Now, I'm one of his kids, I suppose. I love that guy, but the, the people, the, his wife is terrible. I mean, you hate his decision making. You you don't trust in his wisdom. You don't trust him for thinking. Maybe maybe I'm getting a little too off topic here. That that part's not in my notes, but we can't claim to love God and not love his body, his church, his dwelling place. So let's go to 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 number one. All right, my point number one. You know, all these preachers, you got to have a points in your sermon. So here's point number one. Love the church because it is the body of Christ. So the body of Christ, first and foremost, it's, this is a, a foundational reason. I've so much touched on it already, but loving God because it is His body is perfect. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul put it this way, that God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church. Him being Jesus, that's a capital H, Him. Jesus is head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Now Paul, he's not just using this is a this. As a mere metaphor, he is describing a spiritual reality in this world that is beyond our flesh and our blood and what we can see before us, a spiritual reality that the church in its full entirety is an extension of Him here on earth. Where the spiritual touches into the physical through us, through His dwelling place once again. That this, it, it, it connects it all. That to understand the significance of this, we need to understand what being a member of the body is. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul once again explains that the human body is one unit made up of many parts. You know, your body has fingers. It has a hand. It has an arm, which leads into a shoulder, which leads into a torso, to a neck, to a head, back to the neck torso, hip, leg, calf, foot. It's all different parts, all connected. And that all part of it is Jesus connecting it all. We are all baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of Jesus, filled with the same Spirit, all that one Spirit, many parts, but one Spirit, and this unity, this, this unity isn't based on a human criteria, which, which sadly is broken up into things like social status, political beliefs, national identity, 
ethnicity. Like we, we here on earth, we've we found many ways to, to break ourselves up into tribal units again and again and again. Which house do you belong in? Are you a, are you a Hufflepuff? Are you a Gryffindor? Are, what is your, your styling? Do you, are you a punk rocker? Or are you more of a bohemian? What We pick the funniest things to separate ourselves with. But God is calling us to be bound, though different, but bound in the spirit, in the community, in the body of Christ. And because of this, this the loving church means loving its members. And this isn't just like a, a theoretical thought. This isn't just like a, a mental experiment. This is put into action. Just as you would brush your teeth at night. Just as you would you know, eat a salad just as you would take a, a vitamin, and I say vitamin, you take care of the body. How, what is our action for taking care of the body of Christ? That when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. When one part is honored, the whole body rejoices. You can find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that this inter- Dependence, this interweaving, these separate but together is a privilege and a responsibility that when one of us is hurting, our action of love is to help where it hurts. When you scratch your elbow, you clean it off, you put a plaster on, you take care. So it calls us to pay attention to other people. That's that's. That's the getting out of your head part. It ain't all just about you. Sitting wherever you are, if you're sitting on your sofa, if you're laying in bed, where, if you're driving your car right now and listening, it ain't all about you. It ain't all about me. It's being attentive to other people so that we can take care and build each other up in love. That is loving the body of Christ like Christ loves the body. And here's the hard part. Uh, what I think is very hard for a lot of people, it can be hard for me. And I think it, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, uh, Paul, once again, this, this guy Paul, God just spoke through Paul again and again. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, we can take that as face value, that we should work at maintaining peace between the body, between one another. But I think what the implications of this is, is that it takes work to maintain unity and peace. It's not just going to happen. It's not just, there's some fairy dust sprinkled and it's just, it's there forever and ever. Oh, isn't that lovely? We're just, oh, we're two of a kind. We're always going to get along together. Whatever you think, I'll think. And whatever you say, I'll say. And whatever I say, you'll... It doesn't work like that. We're all different. The Bible says that we're all different. Unified by the Spirit. Unified in the name of Jesus. But we're still different. And it takes work. Think of somebody. If it takes you too long, I'm surprised. I'm shocked. It takes me mere milliseconds. Think of somebody that just like rubs you the wrong way. Oh, it's just like, uh, I always think of, uh, I hear shark skin. If you rub a shark skin the wrong way, it can tear the skin off on your hand. Oh, they just rub. If I rub them, oh, if I come in contact with them, oh, I just walk away worse than when I showed up. And man, they happen to go to my, <laughs> the same church I go to. Darn it! But in Ephesians, it's saying it's going to take work. It's going to take some work. It's not always easy. But just because it isn't easy doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. We are commanded to make every effort to maintain unity. So when there's a disagreement, you don't let it go on and on and on. You don't just let, ah, uh, we'll just let silence take it. 
That's not work. We have to actively seek one another out, actively maintain unity with the bond of peace. Number two, so we, we talk about loving the church because it is God's body. Here we are, is loving the church because it is His bride. I, I, I've said this all the time um, because I fully believe it and I think it's one of the great wonders of the world. Uh, and especially when I was a youth pastor, I, I've preached this before, of who here's ever had a crush on anybody? And I've asked that before and got no answer. And I'm like, I've been 15, guys. You've had 15 crushes by this week alone. But think on somebody that you love romantically, that you, you, you've had affection for, a familial love. All that is a reflection of Christ's love for us. Just as when we, for those of you that have been married, when you hold each other's hands and you exchange rings, you exchange vows, promising yourself one to another, the beauty of it is, is Jesus first spoke those words of bond to us and waited ever so patiently, ever so forgivingly for us to say those words back. To say, I'm sorry, and that I love you. And then I'll give my everything to you each and every day in sickness and in health, in joys and in sorrow. Jesus said them first. He's waiting for us to say them back. So loving the church because it is the bride of Christ. Back, back in Ephesians chapter 5, we're starting here in verse 25, that Paul draws a parallel between the love of a husband and the love Christ has for the church. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present to her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That this passage, this is God once again speaking through, through the hand of Paul, a love that isn't sacrificial, but it is all, isn't just sacrificial, but it is purifying that it is, takes what was once broken, making it whole. That Christ's love for the church isn't passive. It's not just there in the background. It's not just air con on a hot day, just there. It's active. It's intentional. What, what a churchy word. It's intentional. Christ gave himself up for his bride. Hung himself up on a cross for his bride. Back whipped open for his bride. Crown of thorns on his head for his bride. Took on the curse of sin for his bride. So we as ourselves, as a part of his bride, encountering members of that church, his bride, each and every day. So we should love church like that. We should align ourselves with Christ's own love. How did you do it? Let me do it. That means our love for church, for, for this community, is sacrificial. It's, it's not based on what it can what the church can do for us. It's what we can do for the church. It's not based on my schedule's not shaping out that way. It, it, it's just, it's, I'm sorry, it's not going to work. I, I said this a few weeks ago. If you missed it, go back to loving God with your whole soul. Uh, so this might speak to some people. It, it's sacrificial of like, oh, football meets on a Sunday, but the, the body of Christ meets on a Sunday. Well, I'll sacrifice football 
for the body of Christ. I'll sacrifice a, a, my kid's sport club because it meets on a Sunday. There's, there's six other days. There's, it, if the body of Christ meets on these two hours every week, these two hours I will sacrifice for. And I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to the bare minimum of two hours. The, the, I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel if I'm trying to defend two hours here. But I'll speak about these two hours because this is the dwelling place of God is when His body comes together and meets. It's not about the four walls. It's not about the time necessarily that they meet. It could be meeting at any time, but if we don't protect it, if we don't sacrifice for it the way Jesus sacrificed, I think we're missing the mark. I, I, I got to say, I think we're missing the mark that we're just doing what's comfortable for us. I mean, thank God Christ didn't do what was comfortable for me. I can can't imagine a crown of thorns being comfortable. I can't imagine all that he went through was comfortable, but he did it. Moreover, loving the church as his bride means honoring and protecting the church in the same way that a husband is called to honor and cherish his wife and the wife is called to honor and cherish her husband. This involves speaking well of the church. Not that, not that we are perfect and blameless, but defending against slander. When people may speak ill, yes, I understand you know, that, that may have happened, but that's not the heart of the church. Yes, 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 uh, this bad thing did happen, but the heart of the church, the heart of Christ is this is restoration, is health, is whole, is that you may know Christ and His love for eternal life. So it is defending the bride, upholding her honor, and, and as being part of that church, as being part of the bride, is being honorable, is being beyond slander. There's a verse in... In the Bible, that this is also not my notes, the verse in the Bible when it's talking about sexual immorality that they say not even a hint. Not even a hint. Not, 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 like, not even an iota of it. Not a hint of sexual immorality. There's another phrase that I like that says where there's smoke, there's fire. Of like, oh, you, you kind of see the symptoms. You can probably find out the problem. No smoke. No smoke. Be beyond slander as a member of the bride of Christ. So it's protecting her reputation. It's protecting her honor. Protecting the church from harm, from, from false teaching, from division. Remember, working for unity and protecting from division, from external persecution, just as a partner would their bride their husband. And let's go on to, to number three. It says, love the church because it is the family of God. The family of God. That when we church, I'm sorry, when we speak of the church, it is a family. This dwelling place of God, God has called us to be brothers and sisters. Adopted into His family. Brothers and sisters, remember all parts of the body united by one spirit, by one baptism. That this familial relationship is baked in. You can't love Christ and call Him Father without recognizing your brother without recognizing your sister. So loving as a family. In, in, in 1 John chapter 3, John marvels at the great love that God has lavished on His children. He says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. He finishes it. He declares it. And that is what we are. That this verse highlights the privilege. The privilege of being called a child of God. I, I, I've referenced this a couple times, but I fully believe it that I've told people that when you're walking into the room, you need to have the bearing of, a, of the child of the king. That when you walk into the room, the spiritual atmosphere of the room needs to change because a child of the creator of the universe has just stepped into it. When you're walking down the street, in your mind, you can say, excuse me, the child of the king is walking here. Now, this isn't you to be rude to other people. This is for you to walk into the confidence and the authority that God has claimed you and, and draped you in royal robes. That you are a child of the king. And that when a situation is against you, you have the favor of the king. The, the, the story of the prodigal son running back to his father after wasting his inheritance, wasting his life, sinning and sinning. And he's coming back to the house with his head hang low. Man, if I can just be the lowest servant in my father's house, that'll be enough for me. And the story goes that the father was waiting every day, waiting, looking at the horizon for their child to come back. And the father sees the child and he can't stand on that patio, whatever it looked like, for the son to come to him. He runs to meet the son, puts his robe on him, puts the signet ring back on his finger, the, the ring that represents the authority of the household. That's us. That's us. We are the prodigal son there. That's each and every one of us that God has draped us in His robes, put His authority in us. But we should not demean one another that we are brothers and sisters here. So we recognize who we are, the authority that Christ has imbued us with intrinsically. But know that He has imbued it in my brother. He has imbued it in my sister, standing with me shoulder to shoulder as this dwelling place of God. And that if I do not love them as the children of God, if I do not love them as my brother and my sister, I am not loving God. I've missed it. That my, all my words and everything that I profess and this life that I have shaped and the actions I take are but dust in the wind and hot air blowing out of my mouth if I do not love my brother and if I do not love my sister. That means I don't really, what am I loving? Because all of a sudden what I'm loving actually isn't God. We are the family of God. So this isn't optional. This is primary. It's not secondary. It's not tertiary. This is primary. Loving your brothers and your sisters is the natural outflow of a love for God. That this love is marked with compassion, with forgiveness, with intentional mutual support. In, in Colossians 3, once again, Paul exhorts, talking about the church, saying, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And all of these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. That this kind of love requires us to be committed to the well-being of our brothers and sisters. I do not care if I am not gentle, if I am not humble, if I am not forgiving, if I am not compassionate, if I am not patient with my brothers and sisters, with the people around me. 
I've missed the mark. I've missed the mark. So to love His church, to love His dwelling place, this community, this body, it it goes by many words. We call it the church, not the four walls. The church, we've got to love it because it's His body. We've got to love it because it is His bride. And we've got to love it because it is His family and our family. And if we've missed the mark here, we've, we've missed it all. That we need to be a people of love. The Bible talks that people will be able to recognize God creator of the universe and his people by how we treat one another, how we treat his church. So let's be a loving people. Let's go out of our way. Let's sacrifice. Let's, let's be compassionate. Let's be, hu- hum- let's, let's be humble. Let's be forgiving. Let's be patient. Just as He was with us. Just as He was with us. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's let's close our eyes. Let's stop. Let's think about all that Christ has done for us. How He was there for us when He didn't have to be. He could have sat comfy and cozy on His throne up in heaven, surrounded by the angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But You rescued us sending Your only begotten Son to die for us when we were yet still Your enemy. And You adopted us, calling us Your sons and daughters. So here we are, part of Your body, Your bride, Your family, Father, continue to shape my heart in renewing my mind every day to be ever more loving, ever more compassionate, ever more forgiving, ever more patient in loving Your church. Out of, a, out of a body, out of a home that supports, that encourages, that heals, that forgives, I can step out into any battlefield. I can step out into any situation, any circumstance, knowing I have the full might of the Lord Almighty and His children on my side. to invite those that are lonely and hurting and brokenhearted and need a helping hand to invite them into the family, that Jesus loves them, died for them. And your body gains one more and another, and another. And it comes from the dwelling place. Father, we thank You. Thank You, thank You, thank You. And all God's people said,
amen and amen. Thank you so much for sticking with me, guys. If you're still here, please tune in next week. Uh, it's going to be the last uh, sermon in this series about loving God. And it's going to be about loving your neighbor. As I was praying there at the end, that the, this, this dwelling place of safety, this place of encouragement and healing and love is for us to step out of reaching out to our neighbor and loving them as ourselves, as God loves us. It's that same love. It's the same. So loving them as God loves us, as we love one another, as we love them. So tune in next week. Uh, Malcolm's going to be finishing off the series. You do not want to miss out. It's going to be great. So tune in next time, whether it's next Sunday or the next day you can. Until then, it's been a, such a pleasure having you guys. Stay safe out there. Uh, I love you. I love you. I'm your brother in Christ, and I love you.